Hello and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today we're going to be revisiting our series that we're doing here at the Black Ponder. It's a YouTube playlist <laughs> and it's called why, does this, why is this channel called the Black Ponder instead of just simply the Ponderer? Why you gotta put black in there? Why is that important? Why should we do that? <laughs> uh, you know, every so often you get, I get comments about that or critiques, so I just wanna explain to you why I think that's important uh, within the context of philosophy, because this is a philosophical channel. And today what, how we're going to explore this is by looking at this book here, talking about this book, is about black feminism again. And I feel black feminism is very important, very important topic to discuss. Got a lot of key philosophical issues as well as, you know, straightforward, practical, um, actionable items that we need to take t for the improvement of social justice. So this book right here is called How We Get Free. Black Feminism and the Kombahi River Collective and is edited by Kianga Yamada Taylor. So this book is about the legacy of an organization called the Kombahi River Collective. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I think I did. And this organization formed in the late 1970s and their goal was to create a form of feminism that was more suitable for the challenges of social justice issues. Because they were a part of the second wave feminism movement, but second wave feminism was not addressing a lot of social justice issues. Apparently issues that African American women were experiencing and also other women of color at that time. So let's go straight to some quotes and we can talk about this further. And then we'll tie it back to why we call this channel the Black Ponder instead of just the Ponder. Quote number one comes from the introduction of the book. We're gonna be talking about a lot of quotes from the introduction of this book. The introduction is written by the editor, Kianga Yamada Taylor. This is from page three. The inclusion of black women on their own terms is not a concession to political correctness, in quotes, or identity politics, in quotes. It is necessary to validate the particular experiences of black women in our society, while also measuring exactly the levels of oppression, inequality, and exploitation experienced in African American communities. More important, looking at the condition of black women reveals the utter inadequacy of what qualifies as social welfare in the United States today. What's being discussed here is why black feminism is necessary. Because, you know, a lot of people think black feminism is not necessary. It's a complete waste of time. People get offended by its very existence. People think it's a tangent. Why do we even have to go there? But it is necessary. Why is it necessary? Because not only does it directly address the conditions of a large segment of the world's population, African American women, right? It directly addresses their condition, their experience, which is just as important as anybody else's experience, and has never been addressed before. Black feminism is the only way that these issues, these conditions, these experiences are even acknowledged. Not only that, but also it exposes and therefore acknowledges the inadequacy of what qualifies as social welfare in the United States today. And that's very important because that's why America is suffering in terms of social justice today. And in turn, the world suffers. I would like to continue on the next page. The CRC, Combahee River Collective, described oppressions as interlocking or happening simultaneously thus creating new measures of oppression and inequality. In other words, black women could not quantify their oppression only in terms of its sexism or racism or of homophobia experienced by black lesbians. They were not ever a single category, but it was the merging of or enmeshment of those identities that 
compounded how black women experience depression. So that's another important thing that's talked about here. How are African American women oppressed? Okay. What do they go through? You, it cannot just be described in terms of racism, you know. That doesn't fully encompass or describe their experience of oppression or how social justice is taken away from them. You can't just talk about their experience as a racial issue or even just as an issue of sexism. That's not the complete story. Homophobia also does not ex explain completely their experience with oppression. We gotta understand that their experience and therefore how America oppresses people in general, how that kind of oppression is complex and its complexity is not adequately described uh, with the framework that we have today, the social justice framework that we have today, the feminism that exists today. We need a deeper, more complex, more descriptive analysis of feminism, black feminism. Basically what I'm getting at is that we need to understand reality, right? We need to understand the complexity of reality to address the issues and the flaws and the problems that face reality. That's why black feminism is important because it's getting at the actual nature of reality. Let me continue with another quote. This is from page eight. Black women were not radicalized over abstract issues of doctrine. They were radicalized because of the ways that their multiple identities opened them up to overlapping oppression and exploitation. Black women's social positions made them disproportionately susceptible to the ravages of capitalism, including poverty, illness, violence, sexual assault, and inadequate health care and housing, to name only the most obvious. There's another important quote because it's saying that you know, black feminism or black feminists are not just doing some sort of a philosophical exercise or some philosophical gymnastics. They're not showing off, trying to create some discipline or school of thought just for the sake of scholarly pursuits. Like, no, that's not what this is about. This is about addressing true experiences, actual conditions experienced by real people. And they're addressing real problems that they have to face. And don't get me wrong, this is not just about African American women, even though they are the center of what's going on here. Uh, but by addressing the African American woman experience, we address the experiences of everybody. Because Why? Because this kind of oppression exists in the world and it interrelates to what's going on everywhere. And by creating solutions to end this type of oppression, we can address all the issues of all kinds of other oppression. Let me continue with what I'm saying with some more quotes. This is page 10. The ability to distinguish between the ideology of the American dream and the experience of the American nightmare. Okay, let's repeat that. Ideology, okay, of the American dream. Ideology, okay experience of the American nightmare, okay? Experience American nightmare. I mean, there's the idea of the American dream and then there's the actual experience of living in America, the nightmare, okay? Theory versus practicality. So let me continue. The experience of the American nightmare requires political analysis, history, and often struggle. Not a reductive analysis that implied identity alone was enough to overcome the sharp differences imposed by social class in our society. So it's not just a focus on race alone. Look at me, I'm a black feminist, I'm black. You need to pay attention to me because I'm black. Being black is, a, it's beyond that. We're trying to examine the reality of oppression. The women of the CRC did not define identity politics, again, quotes, as exclusionary, whereby only those experiencing a particular oppression could fight against it. Nor did they envision identity politics as a tool to claim the mantle of the most oppressed. You know, that's what I was talking about. 
They saw it as an analysis that would validate black women's experiences while simultaneously creating an opportunity for them to become politically active to fight for the issues most important to them. It's a way for them to participate in social justice issues, to fight for social justice, because second wave feminism, that wasn't cutting it for them. Second wave feminism was not addressing African American women experiences. So they had to step up, and which they did, they stepped up and they created their own feminism that was beyond that second wave feminism that came out about in the, the 70s, the 60s. We're on page 11 now. Their analysis, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom, black women's freedom, would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. That quote right there from the CRC, their, their statement, that quote captures the dialectic connecting the struggle for black liberation to the struggle for a liberated United States and ultimately the world. Okay, let's keep going. Let's do some more quotes. Okay, this quote right here is from page 15. This is actually from the Combahee River Collective Statement. Their statement, this black feminist organization, was the foundation of this philosophy, this ideology turn to action. They're the ones that first discovered and brought to everybody's attention this idea of intersectionality. The idea that the concept of race or sexism or homophobia or other kinds of forms of oppression, those experiences by themselves, those descriptors alone do not describe the actual experiences of particular people's relationship with oppression. So listen to this quote on page 15. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the, the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. When you're just talking about racism, right, or when you're just talking about sexism and you're just ignoring other forms of oppression, right, you're not adequately solving the problems of social injustice. Okay, you're not adequately adequately solving those problems. You gotta understand, there this in, oppression in America is very complex, it's very complicated. There's a lot of interwoven forms of discrimination, of hatred, of injustice that are going on. So you can't just talk about the parts. You're not getting a realistic description of the big picture. Let's talk about some examples of intersectionality or explain intersectionality even further as we continue the read quotes from the Combahee River Collective Statement, their official statement that they came out with when this organization was forming. I believe it was in the late 70s. This is page 19. We believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as our politics of class and race. We also often find it difficult to separate race from class from sex oppression because in our lives they are more often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as racial sexual oppression, which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual, e.g the history of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. And that's very important. I mean, that goes, that example right there, the rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression, that goes far as far back, or even farther even, but I mean, we could take that as far back as white slave owners that would rape uh, their African American slaves. You know, and we know presidents that did that too, like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, he did that. Although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with 
progressive black men and do not advocate the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Our situation as black people necessitates that we have solidarity around the fact of race, which white women of course do not need to have with white men unless it is their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. We struggle together with black men against racism while we also struggle with black men about sexism. And that just talk and here we're just addressing this issue of look Black feminism is not about the separatist movement. <laughs> it's not about, look, I'm a black woman. I'm going to stand alone by myself. I don't want to address the oppressions of other people. And you know, and you, you start getting this negative backlash of that's what black feminism is. It's just this crying out, this showing off, this I am woman, hear me roar, extreme example. And that's not what it's about at all. <laughs> it's not what it's about at all. And if you actually read texts written by black feminists, you will understand that. You will understand that. But you gotta listen to black feminists, like actually listen to them. Black feminism does get a very bad rap. A lot of it is founded off of falsehood and basically just lies. Assumptions, opinions that don't really apply or have nothing to do with what black feminism actually is. We shall continue with some more quotes. This quote is from an interview that the editor did with one of the founders of the Combahee River Collective named Barbara Smith. And the editor is asking Smith about identity politics because apparently, uh, which I didn't know, I learned that from just reading this book, identity politics is <laughs> the expression, the concept was first expressed by the Combahee River Collective. They're the first ones that express identity politics. Well, listen to what the, the founder, one of the, the co-founders, Barbara Smith has to say. But however, the right wing got a hold of identity politics and began using it as their whipping boy and their whipping girl. What we meant by identity politics when we originated the terminology was wholly different. What we were saying is that we have a right as people who are not just female. We are not solely black. We are not just lesbians. Who are not just working class or workers. That we are people who embody all of these identities and we have a right to build and define political theory and practice based upon that reality. That was all we were trying to say. That's what we meant by identity politics. We didn't mean that if you're not the same as us, you're nothing. We were not saying that we didn't care about anybody who wasn't exactly like us. Mm -hmm. This is page 61, by the way. This is why you gotta read original sources and you gotta do your research, right? Because that's not how people refer to identity politics today. Okay, when you hear that on CNN or Fox News, that word identity politics or other political analysis that are mainstream today, that's not how they describe their idea of identity politics. But it's, it's been twisted. The concept has been twisted and uh, contorted and conformed to serve the means of the oppressor. And it's a damn shame because that, that was not its original definition. Let me continue, page 62. And unfortunately, because identity politics often have been first introduced to younger people by academics who have a partial understanding of what the depths of it would be, they are also confused about it too. Mm -hmm. Confused, right? Gotta do your research. Let me read you this quote. It's from another interview done in the book by another co-founder of the Combahee River Collective co-founder Beverly Smith. Number one, we were proof positive that there was such a thing as a black woman who was committed to feminism or black women who were committed to feminism. Plural, more than one. We also contributed the fact that for some of us, that is to say feminists were not white. That we had to include all of our identities and experiences. And so for us, that meant dealing with racism was not optional. It wasn't like, oh, 
well, we feel like we're not on the left or feminists are on the left. So, and so, you know, we probably should look at racism or we probably should look at class. We have been incredibly affected by both phenomena. In my case, long before I realized that I also was dealing with sexism. So there was no way that even with our commitments to feminism, we could leave our, our other experiences and our conditions and status behind. Again, this is another important point, right? Because you can't just throw away your experiences or just not acknowledge your experiences. I mean, that's just required to talk about reality or to tr look at the problems that are facing your environment and trying to come up with solutions. <laughs> and again, we bring it back to the Black Ponder, right? Because again, we get these comments and I feel it's important to talk about this. I really do because I think it's one of the huge problems that are acting as obstacles for us to advance as a civilization, as a human species. Because people will say, oh, don't bring that in there. Why you gotta bring in the black? Uh, you know, you're talking about philosophy. You know, you're talking about the meaning of life that, you know, you, we need to go beyond that. We need to stop talking about that. But for me, it's like, well, how could I not talk about that? You know, I, you know, it's not just me identifying as a black man. That's, I mean, that's, that's not really the issue. The point is, is that look, that I, part of who I am, what I have experienced, <laughs> was directly related to me being black. Being black has tremendously affected my life long before I even realized the concept of race, <laughs> like. How I was able to learn about the concept of race was by experiencing oppression based off of my being black, right? So it's, it's, I can't just throw that away or like I can't just talk about the meaning of life or definitions about life and how do we address life's biggest questions without acknowledging these fundamental experiences and conditions of my life, right? And they're saying the same thing with black feminism. Look, if we're gonna talk about the most important problems that are facing life today, we need to talk about the experiences that have fundamentally shaped who I am, right? It's very important. Because if you're not talking about that, then you're not really talking about the most deeply philosophical aspects of life. You're not even going there. And I'll continue straight from where I left off, page 101, by the way. So what we did, which I think is a tremendous contribution to politics in general, is that we really worked and struggled to develop a political analysis that took into account the multifaceted aspects of our identities and of our conditions. We can't just talk about experiences as just some abstract concept or just some sort of deeply philosophical gymnastics or like some intellectual exercise. You know, we have to also talk about the practicality of it and uh, the, the true reality of it and the actual experiences, what we are actually experiencing, because that is reality. Our experience is reality. And this is exactly why <laughs> I call this channel the Black Ponder, right? Because I'm trying to focus on the true nature of reality, not just the abstraction of reality, not just an intellectualized version of reality. I'm not just trying to do philosophical somersaults here. So let me leave you with this quote, and it's from another interview that the editor did with one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter movement, okay? Alicia Garza. And here she's talking about the next step that social justice needs to go. Where do we take social justice from here? How do we move it forward? This is what she says. Our movements also have to be composed of people from across the class spectrum and people who also have power. If we want to compete for power, then part of what it means is we have to amass our power as a unit. And it also means we have to take some of theirs. That's how you compete, right? You've got to break some of their folks off and be like, well, which side are you actually on, right? And it also means that our vision for what a new society can look like has to appeal to more than just 
the intellectual class of activists and organizers. This is page 168, by the way. Skipping a few lines ahead. That's the next step our movement has to take. What brings us together even though we don't all share the same life? We share the same aspirations. We yearn for the same things. And so what does it mean for us then to be in deep and principled relationship with each other and to be not just wanting to be at the table? It's not just about that, okay? It's not just about being at the table, right? She's saying we want the table and we want to decide who is sitting at the table. Then maybe we want to get rid of the table altogether, right? So that's the next step for social justice. You know, we have to be able to understand that somebody who experiences oppression differently than yourself, if you help those people, the people who are experiencing oppression differently, then you help yourself. Why? Because you're fighting against oppression overall. Because oppression is very complicated and incredibly complex. And you know, it does require some extremely deep philosophical analysis to understand how to combat against it. Because a lot of it is outside your individual reality. And here we're talking about the philosophy of it. But don't forget, it's not just about talking about the philosophy of it. With that knowledge comes the action part. And for me, the action part is, you know, getting more people to know about black feminism, because that's where it's at today. That's where social justice needs to be. And it's about calling this channel the Black Ponder and not just the Ponder, because that's where we need to take philosophy. We need to start making philosophy actionable. And philosophy needs to address social injustice. It needs to go that way. I implore you, get a sense of what black feminism really is. Check out this book, How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Combahee River Collective, edited by Kianga Yamada Taylor. Well, you've been watching The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.